Thank you. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Keza Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagement is to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Keza Dugdale. Thank you. Yesterday, the First Minister's poverty adviser said that 56% of children in poverty live in working households. That's children whose mums and dads go out to work but still struggle to make ends meet. Naomi Eisenstadt says in her report that investment in quality, affordable early learning and childcare is crucial. Now, the First Minister claims that every three and four year old has access to 16 hours of free early learning and childcare a week. It sounds good, but parents know it just isn't true. Time and again, I meet mums who tell me they can't get a place for their child that they are told is their right. Last year in this chamber, the First Minister said she was working with local councils to deliver on her pledge. So, can she tell us whether council funding to deliver 16 hours of free early learning and childcare has gone up or down in the draft budget for next year? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I uh, also welcome the report that was published yesterday by the Poverty Advisor. I think it is a very solid report uh, that makes a number of recommendations that this government will consider uh, very seriously indeed. And uh, I note that the Poverty Advisor says uh, that the policy decisions taken by the Scottish Government have, and I quote, been important in protecting people from poverty. Uh, as uh, Kezia Dugdale is well aware, uh, the government uh, currently uh, funds uh, 16 hours a week uh, of childcare for three four-year-olds and for vulnerable two-year-olds. Uh, I have said uh, in the past, and it remains the case, that as well as funding that provision in a global sense, uh, we're working with councils to improve the flexibility of that provision so that it better fits in with the working patterns of parents. Uh, but we're also determined, and this was reflected in the Poverty Advisors report yesterday, over the life of the next Parliament, should the people of Scotland re-elect us in May, to double uh, provision of uh, childcare for uh, young people. This is important to, to parents uh, who will be listening to this. Uh, and the Poverty Advisor said yesterday that as well as quantity, quality was important, which is why yesterday I also announced a million pounds to pilot different ways of delivering that expanded childcare. So that's our policy uh, on childcare. We'll be judged in just a couple of months on our uh, record on that and on many other things. Uh, I'm still waiting to hear what Labour's policy is. In all of that, President Officer, there wasn't even an attempt to answer the question that I asked. And the honest answer is that the Council childcare funding is being cut by this Government's budget. The First Minister's own poverty adviser rightly tells her that affordable and flexible childcare is key to helping people in work get out of poverty. Yet this SNP Government solution is to cut the childcare budget and slash funding for local services. Now, we know the First Minister's promises on childcare are currently not being delivered. So what about her latest pledge to almost double the number of free childcare hours by 2020? A few months ago, the First Minister was asked in this very chamber about how these plans would be delivered. She said, We are working with local authorities to determine the expansion of capacity that will be required. That will be a mix of new build and extension of current local authority capacity. Two months on, can the First Minister tell us how many extra nurseries need to be built to deliver on that promise? First Minister. The promise, well, let, let me take uh, Kezia Dugdale's point uh, in order. In terms of our current policy, we are funding uh, the expansion of childcare that we committed to in this Parliament. And just to remind people uh, who may be uh, listening to this, in 2007, uh, young people, three and four year olds, were entitled to 412 and a half hours of free uh, childcare uh, a year. We've extended that by 45% to 600 hours uh, for three and four year olds, but we've also taken the additional step of extending it to vulnerable two year olds as well. So that's the measure of the commitment. Now, the policy that uh, Kezia Dugdale refers to for the next Parliament, and I'm delighted that she clearly thinks I'm going to be in the position after the election of delivering this commitment. I take that as a, a, a welcome endorsement of the SNP's uh, election campaign at this early stage. But as I said previously in this chamber, I think in response to Ruth Davidson 
on that occasion. We're doing detailed work with local authorities to plan now for that expansion, which will take place over the period of the next parliament. And that will be a mix, and we don't yet know exactly what that mix will be, because we are still working to plan for that expansion. But it will be a mix of new build. That's why I've described it as the biggest capital investment or the most important capital investment of the next parliament but it will also involve existing uh, buildings that local authorities already use. Uh, I've already said it will involve childminders and one of the uh, proposals that Naomi Eisenstadt made yesterday was to look at what's called blended childcare. So we are taking these proposals forward seriously carefully and robustly. And I repeat again, uh, Kezia Dugdale uh, is still to set out what Labour's policy on childcare is. I know what mine is. I know the work we're doing to deliver it. We just seem to have a vacuum coming from the benches opposite. Kezia Dugdale. The First Minister doesn't know how many nurseries she needs, but campaigning mums do. The campaigning group Fair Funding for Our Kids estimate the equivalent of 650 new nurseries would have to be built to accommodate the extra places needed because of the First Minister's latest pledge. Now, she's just described it as the biggest capital expenditure of the next Parliament. But John Swinney's budget this year cuts council capital funding for nurseries by 56%. And by the First Minister's own admission, it would cost £880 million to deliver on her new pledge in running costs alone. Yet at the same time, she is taking half a billion pounds out of council budgets. So let's get this just absolutely clear. The First Minister needs 650 new nurseries, but she's cut the capital budget to build them. She needs £880 million to expand childcare services, but she slashed council budgets by £500 million. Only in the world of the SNP will that deliver a childcare revolution. The First Minister's childcare policy is a mess. Is she hoping parents... Is she hoping that parents are just too busy to notice? First Minister... Well, to be fair to Kezia Dugdale, I know that her day-to-day -day working experience right now involves a rather large mess, uh, otherwise known as the Labour Party. So uh, no, no wonder it's a, a word that's uppermost Order. in her mind. Uh, but Kezia Dugdale, there, in a, a flurry of, of statistics, forgets some of the, the key points. She, she mentions, firstly, capital funding uh, for local authorities. Uh, she will be aware, or... If she's not aware, she certainly should be aware, because John Swinney has outlined it, that the capital budget of local authorities has been re-profiled. Uh, money will be re reallocated. Order. Money that will be reallocated Order. to local authorities in future years. In terms of the overall council budgets, as I said last week and I think the week before, in terms of the overall revenue expenditure of local authorities, uh, they're looking at a 2% reduction and that's before we take account of additional resources for social care, additional resources through the attainment uh, fund and of course the additional investment we plan over the life of the next parliament in transforming the provision of childcare. So I say again, presiding officer, those are our plans. We've set them out and we will set out the budget that support those plans. If Kezia Dugdale really wants to give people in this country a choice in just a few months' time, then she has to do more than whine from the opposition benches. She has to give an alternative. And so far, there ain't no alternative from the Labour Party whatsoever. Kezia Dugdale. Mr Dugdale. There we go, presiding officer. It's not a 56% cut. It's just been reprofiled. <laughs> well, almost a year ago, the First Minister told me that she had looked campaigning mums in the eye and told them that she would fix Scotland's childcare problems. But after meetings with Nicola Sturgeon and her Education Secretary, the more parents hear, the less they believe. Judge me on my record, says the First Minister. Well, here it is. Promises not delivered, budgets cut and parents let down. Instead of delivering what families really need, isn't it the case that the SNP's childcare plan is just one great big con? First Minister. Well, again, 
Kezia Dugdale uh, knows... First Minister... We have, uh, and John Swinney has guaranteed local governments uh, a maintained share of the overall Scottish Government capital budget. That is the reality. It might not suit the Labour Party's increasingly desperate narrative, but nevertheless, those are the facts. Now, you know, just to come back to the central issue here, um, I can point to the achievements of this government in childcare over the life of this parliament and the last parliament. And three and four year olds are entitled to 45% more childcare now than they were when Labour were in office. Two year olds are entitled to childcare that none of them were entitled to when Labour was in office. And not only that, I can point to clear plans for how we are going to transform childcare over the next parliament. So as the Poverty Advisor says, not only are we uh, allowing more parents, mothers in particular, to get into work. We're also supporting young people with the best start in life. So those are our achievements and our plans, and the people of Scotland will judge them, presiding officer. But do you know what? When they're making that judgment, they'll also look at what is the alternative. And I say again, Kezia Dugdale has said zero about what the Labour Party will do for childcare, and that is why the people of Scotland are casting their judgment on Labour and their judgment is to keep them firmly in opposition. Question number two. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Prime Minister. First Minister. Uh, no plans at present. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Uh, this morning we learned that the number of school inspections has fallen from 491 in 2004-05 to just 137 last year a drop of more than 70%. Inspections are a vital means of providing parents with the necessary information to make decisions about their children's schooling. But last year, fewer than 6% of Scotland schools were inspected, meaning that under the SNP, a child can go right through their school career without ever having had their school assessed. If that rate keeps up, it would take 19 years to get round all of Scotland's schools once. Given that, does the First Minister think that parents are getting the information that they deserve when it comes to looking at local schools? First Minister. Well, let me say two things um, about that. Firstly, as Ruth Davidson knows, Education Scotland undertakes a wide range of different activities to promote quality assurance and improvement in the quality of education that is being provided by our schools. Uh, the number of full inspections undertaken varies from year to year and during the period of the implementation of Curriculum for Excellence there was a, a deliberate and I think very correct decision taken to reallocate uh, resources to other improvement activities to oversee the implementation of Curriculum for Excellence. So during that uh, period inspectors were deployed to undertake uh, intensive support and challenge activities with both schools and local authorities and uh, it's also important to point that work was recognised in the recent OECD report, uh, which in relation to CFE implementation said Education Scotland has been a linchpin in providing the guidance, resources and quality assurance. Uh, now, what Ruth Davidson will also presumably be aware of, because I uh, saw him, uh, the, the Chief Inspector, write in the Sunday Times to this effect just a few days ago, uh, there will be an increase in inspections over the coming years, uh, complemented by new types of improvement activity, in particular making sure that we use use the resource of the new attainment advisors that are working on the Scottish Attainment Challenge. So that's the first thing I want to say very briefly, Presiding Officer. The second thing I would uh, say is uh, Ruth Davidson knows my commitment set out in the National Improvement Framework that I published in the first week in January to uh, vastly expanding, transforming the range of information that is available to parents and to the wider public about the performance in our schools. As a result of the National Improvement Framework, within the next couple of years, uh, people will be able to look at the performance of pupils in each school and compare that. And that's uh, the direction of travel that we're headed in, and I think it's the right one. Ms. Davidson. Presiding officer, it was a straight question, and the First Minister didn't seem to want to give a straight answer, so I will. No. Parents are not getting the information that they deserve. Instead, they're being told by the education establishment that it knows best and that everybody else will just have to lump it. One former director of education said in the press this morning that inspections are now, and I quote, virtually useless as a source of information for parents. So the First Minister this morning and on previous days in this chamber has urged opposition parties to offer proposals on how to improve a system if they complain about it. So we say this, it is time to re-establish 
an independent expectorate out with the arms of the Scottish Government so that parents know when their school is measured it is done so entirely separately from those people who are setting the policy. We want more transparency and information for parents and an inspection regime that demands high standards and improvement from coasting schools with parents crucially given regular and up-to-date information. Does the First Minister back that plan? First Minister. Uh, firstly, the inspectorate is independent. The inspectorate does demand high standards from schools. Local authorities uh, also have a statutory uh, duty to make sure uh, that the, the quality of education is what we would expect. I've already outlined uh, why and, and what uh, the inspectorate was focusing on during the period of Curriculum for Excellence and the plans to increase the number of inspections over the next few years. But I actually want to do much more uh, than Ruth Davidson has just outlined there. I want to give parents and the public direct information about the performance of pupils uh, in our primary schools and lower secondary schools uh, because at the moment we don't really have that. So under the national improvement framework, uh, once that is firmly established, what we will see uh, are the percentages of pupils in every uh, primary school across our country uh, who are achieving the different required levels of curriculum for excellence. And for the first time, this is a revolution in transparency in Scottish education. For the first time, parents will be able to look at that, the public will be able to look at that, they'll be able to look at schools that are doing well, schools that are doing less well, and that will give all of us the information we need to drive further improvement. So I'm much more ambitious in terms of transparency than Ruth Davidson is. I have a number of constituency questions. Graham Day. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the difficulties being experienced by Johnson Press and its identifying 21 Scottish titles ranging from Scotland on Sunday to the Arbour Road Herald in my constituency as being sub-core, raising concerns over the future of these newspapers. Given the journalistic traditions of some of these titles, their importance to local communities and the jobs at stake, can I ask whether the Scottish Government will engage with the company and do what it can to ensure these newspapers have a future? First Minister. Uh, can I thank Graham Day for an important question and uh, give him the, the, him the assurance that, yes, we will seek to engage with the company. And as with any company where there is the potential of job losses, uh, the arrangements we put in place primarily through PACE will be available uh, should they be required. But can I also make a wider point, and that's about the importance in our democracy of a free, uh, vibrant and dynamic uh, media. And I, I think all of us will be concerned at this latest announcement coming on the back of a uh, recent announcement we've seen about job losses and other uh, areas of the media and I think all of us uh, have a duty to make sure that we've got a properly resourced uh, media in this country uh, to hold all of us uh, to account as well as contribute to the national debate that we all want. Cara Hilton. Um, it was announced this week that at least 80 jobs will be lost to FMC Technologies in my Dunfermline constituency by June and the workforce tell me that the real job loss figure could be substantially higher as this figure doesn't include contract staff. Given that FMC Technologies has lost 2,000 jobs worldwide since January last year, there is real uncertainty about job security going forward and my constituents feel that if they're paid off now or in the future there's going to be very little chance of them finding employment within the oil and gas industry. So what action will the First Minister take to support my constituents working at FMC FMC technologies at this time of low oil prices and high job losses. First Minister. Well, of course, we're aware of the situation that the member outlines and the government will uh, be engaging uh, with the company. And as I said in response to Graham Day, we uh, make available uh, to uh, the workforce of any uh, company in this situation uh, the resources of pace so that we're doing as much as we can to avoid uh, redundancies, but also help those who are facing redundancy. And uh, I'm sure the Enterprise Minister would be happy to uh, meet with the member to discuss this particular case in more detail. Dave Thompson. Uh, the First Minister will be aware of this morning's announcement of 100 job losses at uh, Marine Harvest, the bulk of them in the Highlands and Islands and many in my uh, constituency. This is a large number of jobs uh, for uh, small communities to lose. Will the First Minister ensure that all will be done to assist those who may lose their jobs and outline what measures the Government will be putting in place to help with this serious matter? First Minister. Well, obviously, as uh, in the case of the previous two companies that I've been speaking about, this will be a particularly anxious time for employees and their families. Uh, the Scottish Government is in contact uh, with the company and it has approached Highlands and Islands Enterprise to identify redeployment opportunities. 
Uh, my officials uh, have, as I say, been in contact with Marine Harvest uh, and will shortly be meeting uh, the company and uh, to discuss what can be done to support staff. Uh, we remain fully supportive of the sector, which is a key industry for Scotland in terms of supporting employment, particularly in our remote coastal communities. Uh, and it's currently, of course, estimated to generate economic activity in Scotland worth more than £1.8 billion a year, supporting more than 8,000 jobs. So it's extremely important and the response of the government will recognise that. Question number three, Willie Brenny. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Brenny. Uh, this week I received a letter from Amazon HQ in London. They boasted that they paid workers £7.20 per hour, even though that is well below the national living wage. The Scottish Government paid almost £1 million to the company just last year. Does the First Minister think it's wise to reward companies that pay workers such low wages? First Minister. Well, I think all companies uh, should pay the tax that they're due uh, to pay. Uh, the Scottish Government, in the limited tax responsibilities we have, takes tax avoidance very seriously. Um, of course, I wanted to, us to have more tax responsibilities, something Willie Rennie argued vociferously, vociferously against. So we will continue to stand up for fairness uh, and for companies paying the tax that they are due. But I have to take a, take a different view to the one that Willie Rennie articulated in a debate we did uh, in Dundee on Monday evening, where he seemed to suggest uh, that Fife would be better off without the jobs uh, that are offered by Amazon. I suspect people working in that company would take a very different view as well. Willie Rennie. I know, I know she finds it difficult to listen to anybody else, but the question was about wages, <laughs> not about tax. I'll leave her, if she's too embarrassed to do it, I'll leave her to defend low wages. And no one is saying, no one is saying that Amazon should close. But I want the government to support good jobs. This is about good jobs. Amazon workers have been in touch this week too. They confirm what I have said. It's an exceptionally horrible place. The employment agencies cream off from everyone's wages. Meanwhile, this is about tax, just the wee tag up. Meanwhile, Amazon pays hardly any tax in this country. The Poverty Alliance promotes the living wage. They get a small Order. grant. The Poverty Alliance promotes the living wage. They get a small grant from the Scottish Government. It's a brilliant project. But why give Amazon four times as much money? for low wages as you give the Poverty Alliance to champion the living wage. Will the First Minister make a commitment not to give any more grants to companies without wage guarantees? First Minister. Well, my apologies to Willie Rennie if I misheard uh, his first question. My, my comments about tax avoidance stand, though, and they stand very strongly. But on the living wage, Willie Rennie, I hope, would agree that this government is arguably doing more than any other government across the UK to promote the living wage. The living wage accreditation scheme now has more than 400 companies signed up to it and there are more people in Scotland paid the living wage now than in any other UK nation, in any other part of the UK outside the south east of England and that's a point that was recorded in the Poverty Advisors report yesterday and we will continue to work uh, directly with companies to encourage them to sign up and to pay the living wage. I will ask Rosanna Cunningham, the Fair Work Secretary, the only government in the UK that has a cabinet level minister responsible for fair work, to engage directly with Amazon and with other companies to get more people paid the living wage. So we will take whatever action we require to take to make sure we are standing up for decent wages for everybody across Scotland. Question number four, Roderick Campbell. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the Resolution Foundation report, The State of Working Scotland. First Minister. Well, I welcome the findings of the Resolution Foundation uh, report, which was published yesterday, particularly the finding that pay in Scotland has risen faster than it has in any other nation or region in the UK. Uh, I'm proud that this government's commitment to the living wage means 80% of people in Scotland are already now paid at least the living wage. There are, as I've just said, more than 400 living wage accredited employers. Uh, and the rise in pay in Scotland will have contributed to one of the other findings of the report, that household incomes fell by less in Scotland than the UK average during the recession. Uh, so that's good progress, but there's much work still to do. And the Resolution Foundation gives us, I think, some very valuable analysis in making sure that we continue to build on progress. Roderick Campbell. 
I thank the First Minister for that answer. I was pleased to see yesterday's statistics on employment and along with the Resolution Foundation report showing Scotland now has the highest level of wages of countries in the UK, yeah, yeah. Scotland is clearly showing that we can tackle inequalities and grow the economy. Can the First Minister tell me what action she will be taking to build on this good foundation to increase jobs and wages? First Minister. Well, I think the, the member is right to note the progress on both wages and employment this week and uh, can I take the opportunity to welcome uh, the figures yesterday showing the rise in employment in Scotland uh, to record levels and the substantial drop in unemployment. Uh, that is all progress but there is no room for complacency and that's why we're working to do more both in terms of employment and in terms of wages. Our economic strategy sets out uh, our mutually supportive goals of increasing competitiveness and tackling inequality um, and we'll continue to make sure we do support the living wage accreditation scheme and the work of the Fair Work Convention to make sure that as we hopefully see employment continue to increase in Scotland, that's fair work uh, with people doing uh, a, a decent day's work, getting a decent day's wage in return. Question number five, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister, in light of the foil in oil prices, when the Scottish Government will publish an updated oil and gas bulletin focusing on the impact on jobs. First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government's focus is absolutely on what we can do to support uh, the industry uh, and the workforce who are facing uncertainty at what is a, a worrying time for them. Uh, we continue to do all we can within devolved powers to help the sector. Last year I set up the Energy Jobs Task Force. The task force has already helped to support more than 2,500 individuals and 100 employers through the current downturn and it will continue to support the industry to improve collaboration, cooperation and innovation. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the First Minister for that response? But it has, of course, been more than six months since the last oil and gas bulletin was slipped out on the last day of term. Yet in the intervening period, oil has dropped to $27 a barrel, some 70% lower today than the price 18 months ago, and industry experts predicting it dropping further to $20 a barrel. 65,000 jobs lost already and more anticipated, and we cannot afford to lose these skills in the future. So what action will the First Minister take to protect these jobs and when Will she publish a revised oil and gas bulletin so we can consider the impact on jobs and the economy? First Minister. Well, we will continue to do all that we can within our responsibilities to support the industry and to support the jobs that are dependent on it. For example, uh, the Scottish Cabinet will hold a, a special session on Tuesday next week attended by Lena Wilson, the chair of the Oil and Gas Task Force, to look at what the task force has already done and what more it can do to support those in the industry. I wrote uh, also to the Prime Minister just yesterday, uh, urging him to agree with me that we should accelerate the finalisation of a city deal for Aberdeen, uh, to, funded jointly by the UK and Scottish Government, so that we can help Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire councils invest in the infrastructure that the city needs. So we'll continue to take all action that we can, but of course we'll also uh, continue to call on the UK Government to make sure that there is an appropriate fiscal regime uh, for the North Sea. Uh, I note uh, the comments both of BP uh, last week when they said, uh, when announcing very regrettable job losses, that they uh, were confident in their long-term future in the North Sea. I also note the comments of Oil & Gas UK about the uh, future of the sector if we do the right things now. We are determined to do the right things now and we call on the UK Government to do likewise. Margo Fraser. Uh, thank you. Uh, the First Minister will be aware that this Parliament's Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee produced a report on Monday saying that the oil and gas sector could have a sustainable future with the uh, correct support. Uh, I wonder if she would agree with me that vocal campaigns for divestment from the oil and gas industry from pension funds and others are unhelpful, are potentially damaging and may in fact, if followed, lead to further job losses than we have already seen. First Minister. Well, I agree that anything that, that undermines uh, the industry at this time is unhelpful. I'm also aware of the report that Murder Fraser uh, refers to. I think it was a very helpful uh, report and it's one of the many things that the Cabinet will discuss as we uh, consider how we continue to give the industry the support it needs at this time. Question six, John Mason. I thank you to ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government regarding the possible reintroduction of the post-study work visa. First Minister. Well, since the publication of the Smith Commission report, uh, the Government has remained committed to working with our UK counterparts to ensure that a post-study work route is reintroduced in Scotland. And this has been raised with the UK Government at a number of meetings at both ministerial and official level. 
Uh, we're therefore deeply disappointed, and I have to say I'm uh, rather angry that the Secretary of State for Scotland uh, recently indicated, without any real consultation, that there's no intention on the part of the UK Government to reintroduce the post-study work visa for Scotland. Um, I understand that the UK Immigration Minister intends to meet with the cross-party post-study work steering group, and I would expect and certainly hope that the UK Government will take the concerns of the Scottish Government and indeed the united voice of Scottish stakeholders fully on board. I believe there is a consensus in this parliament and out there in Scotland to reintroduce the post-study work visa and I think it's time the UK government got on and did it. Yeah, I thank the First Minister for that answer. I mean, I wonder if she would agree with me that not only do the students themselves benefit from being able to work after their studies, but the Scottish economy and Scottish society benefits as well from having these people living here. First Minister. I agree wholeheartedly with that. If we're going to invest in educating uh, the best and the brightest people from all over the world, then surely it makes sense to try to uh, encourage them, once they graduate from university, to make a contribution in our economy, to give something back to economic and social life here in Scotland. And of course, we know that people who come to Scotland from all parts of the world uh, make a real and rich contribution to our society, just as Scots who go from here to other parts of the world do there. So I think the UK government's actions here are short-sighted and wrong-headed, uh, and I urge them to change their minds if they there is any uh, credence whatsoever to what we keep hearing about a respect agenda, they will recognise the consensus on this issue and do something about it. Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. We are now moving to members' business, so members who are leaving the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.